um, and went off without a hip. So excited for arts and sciences to, uh, to do the same as well. So um, I think probably what would be best before we dive into presentation, uh, maybe if we just go around the horn and uh, introduce ourselves. Um, first and foremost, hi everyone, I'm Michael. Um, I'm serving as student body president. I'm an animal science student um, in College of Agriculture. So if you could just name uh, the, your major and then your, the college that you're representing, um, that would be awesome. So, Laura, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, um, I'm Laura Bain, and um, I'm a second year PhD student, and I represent grad students. I'm Andrew McFarland. I'm here representing the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Chuck Haber. I'm the provost. Uh, I'm Cameron Kroger. I'm the student body vice president. I'm Sharon Holling, majoring in human development, family science, health, and human sciences. Laurel Luttrell, professor in the libraries, and I'm here as faculty senate president. Ethan Erickson, CFO, COO. I'm Amit Chakvarty, I'll be making a presentation. I'm Chris Culbertson, I'm the associate dean for research and graduate studies in arts and sciences. Hi everyone, Thomas Lane, vice president of student library dean of students. Uh, Jacob Hoffman, I'm representing the College of Education, but I'm not majoring in that uh, right now, so. Uh, Interesting case here. <laughs> I'm Alex the Pause. Um, I'm majoring in finance and I'm representing the College of Business. I'm Ben Keller. I'm majoring in computer science and I'm representing the College of Engineering. Hi, all. Max Harmon, senior in biochemistry and global food systems leadership here in my role as student services feature. And I'm Blake Phillips. Uh, I'm a junior here studying or in the College of Business uh, as the other co chair of the committee for Speaker of the Student Senate. That was words. That was <laughs> <laughs> Those were words. It was almost Tuesday. It is Tuesday, actually. Um, but yeah, almost over the hump of the week. So uh, yeah, thank you everyone for, for sharing. Um, and we're going to just jump right in. So Dean Chuckabarty and, and Chris, take it away. Uh, what do you want to introduce on Zoom? Oh, shoot. Sorry. Uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, my name is John Martin. I'm the student government president here on the Salina campus, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Awesome. Thank you, John. Sorry that I, that I forgot you there. Um, the voice uh, is coming through. <laughs> awesome. Great. Yeah, take it away. Dean uh, do I get a pointer or anything like that? That I don't think that there's one, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm so sorry. All right, we, we have one taker here. <laughs> you use the mouse if you want. The mouse is going to use? Yeah, if you just like <laughs> click, it should work, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right, that should do it. Oh, really quick. Do you want to? If you move and click the X on the live transcript, um, up on, sorry, <laughs> I just feel like, all right, I know this is going to interfere in the, the future. There we go. There we go. Um, that should be oh, good to go. Okay, good, good. Well, uh, thanks everyone, and good afternoon into the evening. Um, I'm here today to, to tell you about the, the student coursework fee that the College of Arts and Sciences has. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of that fee, how it has evolved, and uh, how this has impacted our student success in the college and beyond. So that's, that's the plan today. So this is the philosophy behind our fee is that the magnitude that we set for the student fee has two fundamental principles. One is ensuring student success. And the second is access. So maintaining the land grant university, uh, making education affordable to the, to the students. So these are the two principles that we have used to set the, the amount of the fee. So student success and 2025 goals, there are many, many um, items in our 2025 strategic plan that connects to uh, the fee. For example, uh, in theme one, it connects to research, scholarly and creative activities and discovery, the RSCAD, undergraduate experience, graduate experience, all of those, the fee actually helps 
to provide. And then in the college plan, we have facilities to support student growth, students prepared to make a difference, top 50 graduate programs, top 50 educational foundation. So these are also themes that the fee will, will help us or helping us to, to achieve. And then history of the fee. So the fee was set at um, $8 per credit hour uh, from 2014 to 16. And this was mainly to address the backlog of outdated teaching equipment and support student research travel to a, uh, to a small degree, not, not as much as we could do later. From 2017 to 2021, we have a $16.70 per credit hour fee. And that's the fee I'm going to discuss today in, in this, in this uh, opportunity. And so the additional fee went to uh, increase the stipends for college GTAs and to support advisors uh, in the college. So every, Every dime, as we'll see later, goes to the students. The college does not have any kind of um, a percentage that they keep in the, in the college for any other purpose. Every bit of it goes, for, uh, goes to the students. Then last year, we also had an online fee, which is not part of this. That online fee is used to provide online access, creating high quality uh, online courses and all that. And that fee and this fee together to make things simpler was put together and the fee became 1740, kind of a weighted average between um, the face-to-face -face fee and the online fee, okay? So today I'm not going to talk about the online part of the fee but only about the, um, the 1670 fee that, that we have been working with. Okay, so here first is a quick comparison of our fee with, with other colleges and the arts and sciences fee, as you can see at the extreme right. And it is, um, it is lowest of all the colleges that, that are listed there. And again, it fits in with our idea of making education affordable and accessible from our land grant mission. Uh, the distribution of fee is the following, as I was saying, is that directly the fee revenue, 95 and half percent of the fee directly goes to the department and to support the advisors in departments, GTA salary supplements, undergraduate student salaries, learning assistants, they might be working in the lab, they might be working uh, in the studios or various other teaching activities uh, that they might, might participate. And then we have the, the classroom supplies and materials. So that's why the 95 and half percent of the fee revenue goes directly. The remainder is retained, but this retained is under code because this one is really not retained for the college. College distributes that in a different format. So it distributes for undergraduate research scholarships and undergraduate and graduate research travel scholarship. And also we used to fund some large item uh, equipment for teaching purposes that, that we have not been able to do in the last um, few years. Okay. Now, here is the, the fee allocation, that's 1670. So um, when we set the fee, there are three parts to it. And, and this needs a little bit of of um, explanation, how, what we did there. So for the GTA portion, where a large sum of our money going now, this is what happened. So before the fee 
was installed, instilled, um, the GTS type in in our college was pretty much at the bottom of our peers, okay? And at that point, we have a very modest goal, something that no one in this room want to be, that is average. So that was our goal. We wanted to be median average with our fee in the big 12 at that point. And so we said that fee uh, to make the, uh, to provide some additional stipend for our GTAs so that they were at the median of our peers in 2016 level, okay? Now five years have passed and so we have fallen behind. So you can see that a larger part of the money is going to, uh, to the GTAs. Also, another thing happened is that the student credit hour in the college also has gone down. Enrollment is down all over the university. And so we're collecting less money. But the GTA stipend supplement and the advisor's salaries, these are fixed costs, right? These are, this doesn't scale with the number of students pretty much. I mean, okay, so an advisor looking, for, uh, looking after 300 students it might go down, say, 10% to 290, but you need the same person to do the job, right? So it's kind of a fixed cost. So after you do the fixed cost, then what you have the flexible part, that's the student research travel, uh, the instructional supplies, equipment, that's the part, undergraduate experience part, that gets chopped back because you have to pay the fixed part. And that's why um, you can see that we had to shift a little bit from our um, from our range in what we have we have proposed uh, originally in, in 20, 2016 when you, when I stood before maybe not exactly this composition but pretty much you know when I presented that that's what the, we actually predicted that that this might happen. If if we cannot, uh, if you want to match the, the stipend and all, so the two parts to it. One is um, one is that um, the GTS stipend was matched in 2016. Advisor salary was matched in 2016, and the cost and salaries and prices have gone up for that. And then our student credit are also went down. So that's why you see you see some shift from, from the original plan. And this is what shows that the fee revenue has gone down um, quite a bit in this last four years. And that's what creating this asymmetry from, from what we have proposed and what we, we have to spend it on. And there's a fixed part of, to the cost also. And here are the numbers that um, we have. So 2019, 20, and 21. And these numbers, much of it, you, you probably have received from, from um, Ethan's office. Fran has sent those, some of those numbers. We have put that in a, in a way that's more um, understandable to, to this group. So we have uh, fee revenue, a lab fee revenue and the number of student credit hours and per credit hour fee amount. So we put that together. So uh, first three lines are mainly revenue. And then the expenses, uh, the advisor, GTA, classroom, the large equipment we have not been able to, to fund in last three years, uh, classroom supplies, student salaries, and then student research and, and travel awards. And we had in 2021, because of this uh, global pandemic, we have much less um, student travel and also some of the classroom um, equipment we didn't need as much. So we had a $400,000 $400, kind of surplus only for last year. If you look at other years, we actually are overspending or pretty much spending at the same level. But actually the need for, the, for this fee actually slightly larger. 
And that's why we are putting a proposal uh, that's not today's business, but still that to, to match all these things that the fee has to be increased by, by a little, little bit more. And, but this year we'll be able to do all that a little bit better because of the one year surplus coming from, from the pandemic. But that's not a general trend. That's just last year, the student uh, travel and equipment face to face, all these are picking up this year. We are getting um, pretty much um, the, from the department heads, we are getting a, a, the kind of request that we are getting will actually overshoot some of this um, money that we have saved last year in a very special circumstances. And these are some of the um, advisors that you can see. Uh, each advisor is typically responsible for 300 measures. So um, sometimes the department doesn't have that many measures. So for example, if you look at the third line on the left, you will see that uh, Jenna uh, uh, is looking after three departments physics, statistics, and biochemistry, which is a pretty demanding job because all these uh, majors have their own needs and variations. Some of some often, some of them do um, dual majors and double majors. And so it's a pretty challenging job. And then um, um, Gabe is doing SSW and then we have uh, one person I'm, I'm looking for is uh, Kathy. Kathy Lelich, uh, uh, first person on the, on the right, she's doing history and, and political science. And then psychological sciences, which is one of our uh, large major department, you have two advisors. So you have Sarah Buchanan and, uh, and Jason Walls. So it depends on what the majors are, we are scaling our advisors in, in that way, typically targeting 300, but sometimes a little bit less because if you are doing really physics, statistics and biochemistry, handling 300 students is very difficult. So that number is more like 200, 250, something like that. Okay, all right. And now um, here are some student perspective on the on the advisor, so we have uh, we have been contacting students, we have been contacting department heads, and the GTAs to get a different perspective on the on the fee. So this is a student in medical biochemistry, and this was uh, the advisor who has left uh, K State, uh, Jesse uh, Changstrom. She was also doing uh, physics biochemistry and, and statistics at that point. And she's done a terrific job. Her advising has played an important role in my success. So, you know, these are the kind of things that, that we like to hear, right? Yeah. And, and, and a good advisor, when she or he makes a difference in a, in a student's academic life, um, the effect is enormous, enormous. You cannot really put a monetary um, number award for, for that. Okay, now we go to the GTA salary supplement. As I have said, um, prior to 2016, GTA salaries were, well, I, we have been modest here, say that below peer institutions, but we were really near the bottom at that point. But now we were at 2016. Um, average level and, and the advantage that, that it did that we can recruit quality graduate students. And the moment you recruit quality graduate students, it affect graduate education, but it also affect undergraduate education because many of these GTAs are actually in the classroom. And, and it also builds the morale of, of the students when they feel like that, yes, I've been compensated to at least to a peer median level, uh, they feel more motivated and, 
and dedicated to uh, do the, the work that they've been doing. But also asking, keep in mind, we're asking them to do many things. We're asking them to be a student, to, to, to work towards their degree. We're also asking them to teach and be part, take part in the, in the uh, classroom. We're also asking them to take part in, the, in creating new knowledge. So we are asking a lot from our GTAs. Continuing. Okay, so here is a, a GTA um, from uh, biochemistry and molecular biophysics. <clears throat> and this GTA has won the presidential award for excellence in undergraduate teaching. This is a remarkable thing, right? This is not just a competition in the college, but this is a competition in the whole university. So we are very proud when one of our GTAs win this. And, and they are regular. They, they win these awards regularly, right? Not, not just in one um, particular, uh, one, one example only. So you can, you can read that. I'm going to keep this, um, this talk with you. You can read the details, but much of my success as a student, I owe to Ashish. This, this is, these are the kind of things that we like to hear again from, from our students. Okay, now we go to undergraduate experience. One thing I want to point out is that, and this is an important thing for this group to to, to be aware of is that we distribute the fees to all departments. Every single department uh, gets the fees money. Okay. So every single department has students who are participating in creating new knowledge, so undergraduate research, student travel everywhere. Not all departments have graduate programs. So the GTA part is, is a bit selective, but um, probably three departments out of 22, three or four, three maybe, uh, do not have a, a graduate program. So other than that, all other departments are getting um, GTA support. So it, it's, it's all over, it's not just that is for the labs and for the science departments. It's everywhere in the college that, that students are, are being supported. For a, a list of large equipment, and you'll see what, when we could support them, um, um, where the, those things were. But here is um, undergraduate research. These are research award. This is not just research in the college that, that we will show a different measure after that uh, towards the end. But this is the students who received a thousand dollar scholarships plus $250 goes to the department for research related supplies. Because oftentimes they will participate in a lab which, or they might need some materials and supplies. They might work with the faculty member uh, uh, whose time will be spent on it. So the department will get a tiny bit of, of money so just, just to recognize that a faculty member is working with the student. The important thing here is that the student gets the award, not that faculty member gets the award and chooses a student. Here the student gets the award who can work with anyone they want. This, this is a very different model. And we like this model because it creates often interdisciplinary work. A student might choose two faculty members. They can write a proposal together. It has happened. It has happened to many students, you know, that students will, uh, will work with multiple, mul multiple faculty members. I'll give you an example, personal example. When I was in physics, we had a student who was working with me and another faculty in dance. In dance, we were actually creating some interdisciplinary work um, using some physics principle and to write a ballet. These are the kind of things you can do in this college, right? Because of our uh, diverse presence. 
pretty much fun actually. We had a we had a show in in McCain on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then student travel. If you can see why we had some money saved last year, because our number dropped from two hundred fifty to to seven <laughs> because of the pandemic. So we saved some money there. Typical money given to a student between four hundred and eight hundred dollars. Once they get that, they can show it to other groups in, in, the, in the university and get maybe another $200 from here, $200 from there. The, uh, the uh, major advisor might put in some money together and their travel is, is taken care of. It's, it's a great opportunity for our students to travel to conferences, present their work, get to know the field, make connections and network, and that becomes so useful to them when, when they graduate or are going to graduate. So that also comes here. And here is some student perspective on the lab supplies. So when learning in a class lecture, definitions, diagrams, and techniques can begin to swim together and become confusing. That is why labs are so important because the application of what you learn in lecture can help you to really see what's actually being, being discussed. So this, this is, um, is a biology major who, who told us that, but that is um, not just in biology, it, it's, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. Okay, now we move on from the student perspective to the department perspective, which is also important to know because the department heads um, writes to us, every year we have a process that they write to us with their needs of the supplies need, student need, um, assistant, learning assistant need, various other things, of course the GTA needs that they write to us. So you can see that this pays for and replaces uh, checkout equipment for students, for class assignments as cameras, microphones, and drones. So this is from journalism and mass communication. Okay. And then used to purchase software and, and update computers uh, throughout the, the 22 department. Softwares and computers you need for instruction pretty much anywhere you go. And so that's, that's what it, it pays for. Uh, another department, if this is in modern language, and they are talking about um, support of our graduate teaching assistants who are core to our instructional mission. Introducing students in the language sequence to the languages and cultures we teach. That's what the GTS do. And you want to attract really good GTS for that, for that purpose, right? I mean, teaching a, a foreign language to, to, uh, to the students, you better be good at it. So we want to attract um, good, good performing, uh, strong students for, for that. Now we're talking about um, advising and this is Gary Brace in psychological sciences. In terms of advising, we're able to add a second advisor. See, I showed you that um, a psychological sciences has two advisors because the number of student majors there gone up quite a bit. And the lab funds also provide software and computer infrastructure, right? And that, that's everywhere. That's everywhere. And, and read the last line, if you will. Not so obvious stuff such as sheep brains for demonstration purposes. I love to be in that class. <laughs> you know. Large equipment. Okay, so for large uh, equipment, uh, the fee shortfall doesn't allow us to do so last three years, but we have done this in the past. And you can see, uh, because when you started the fee, we are pretty much balanced our, with student credit hour, and the fee and we wanted to do everything. So the large equipment was possible then. 
and look at the things that, that we, could, we could provide to the department, uh, the, all sorts of things, laser engraving, um, COM studies, the unified collaboration system, in geology, carbon nitrogen analyzer, in MTD, musical instruments, in physics, extra apparatus, storage and experiment, in chemistry, um, various um, equipments to, uh, to, to, to figure out you know, what gases are coming out, chromatography equipments. So these are big equipment. These things vary between, I think our cutoff limit was 8,000, but many of them goes into eight to 30,000 range. These are practically impossible with other college resources to provide to the department. And that's why when the fees had a, had a shortfall, we could not handle that for last few years. Okay, moving on. Here is um, the real impact of the fees. These are our retention and and graduation rates and research participation rates. So see what happens here. So in 2011, our six year graduation rate was 53%. And it went up, fiscal 21, we went up by 10 percentage point. As, as you know very well, every percentage point up there is many people's work. It's, it's difficult, right? It's difficult to, to improve from that, that level. And the retention rate also um, went up from 77 to 24 and a half. Our target is 90% there. Um, and our graduation rate is 70%. And look at the, how many students participate in, in undergraduate um, research. So that number, because we have a course that they sign up for, that number may not be all unique because some of them may sign up in the fall and spring and all that. But what happens is that the college has a large um, RSCAD presence. And because of that infrastructure, now if you give $1,000 to a student, they can actually participate in, in, in research. And because of all that, that's why we wanted to show that number because these are connected. Some of the students are, are supported by departmental resources or, or federal funds, but also the research scholarship that you provide from the fees blends in very well and, and helps students to, to do well. And the students who are at the upper end, they also benefit quite a bit, quite a bit from this. And, and some of the success rates we have are really spectacular. I mean, the students in our medicinal biochemistry, um, they had a hundred percent success for going to medical school, things like that. Yeah. Will it happen every year? Probably not, but, but um, it, it did happen. But it will be very close, if not hundred percent, it will be very close that that kind of success going to be in the, in the 80 to 90% range some year, maybe 100, will happen year after year. Okay, and so in summary, this is what um, I have presented to you in the last, um, what, about 35 minutes. So two ways that you set the uh, amount of the fee. One is student success until we wanted to make it affordable and all the money goes to students. Uh, first directly to the department, then some money is kept in the college, which is then distributed as research scholarship and undergraduate and graduate travel, and when we can, also large equipment grants. And that's the story of, of the college fees. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to present you.
thank you so much for all of the work, um, the intrepid party that you um, put in, and Chris as well for. Um, yeah, Chris has done the work. I give the talk. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, know the, you know the model. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. Um, and yeah, just want to open it up right now, um, if it's sure. okay with both of you, for for questions from the group. Yeah, um, I'll be very happy. To. Yeah, uh, I, I want to make sure that that you see in detail what we have been able to achieve with the fee. Any questions from Tim? I'll, I'll start off. Um, well, first, I just want to say uh, I thought it was very well put together um, and it's um, very success orient orientated. I have a question on the slide number 15. Um, for the 2021, um, how the, the ASHA with the pandemic impact? Uh, Why, which, which one you are talking about? Slide 15. Uh, oh. What number is it? It is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is the one, yeah. Yes. So I just have a question and I just a little clarification on um, the pandemic impact from 2021 to 20, from 2020 to 2021. Um, I just think it's interesting the impact has had more on this year than last year. That's you get my question? Uh, uh -huh. Since like 2020 was closer to the hit of the pandemic, in 2021 we're coming more out of it. Uh, this is not like a, uh, this is not calendar year, so this is academic year. So it goes oh. hands half and half and on both sides. Okay. Yeah. That's why. Okay, I get it. So if you remember, in March 20, we kind of uh, went back to to all uh, online offerings. Okay. So that that's. You're seeing the effect of that in and into the first half of 21. Okay. Yeah, there was practically no travel. Actually, university travel was, was stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the students were also not risking, even when it, it, it was kind of okay to travel, but they were not risking. Okay, so this is like spring. Okay. So last it. fall and this spring, pretty much that will be the yeah. measure. And I, I think those numbers too, um, I mean, academic year and fiscal year kind of correlate um, together. So yeah, the, 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 the 2020 there, the 2020, so that's fall of 19 and spring of 20. Okay. So there are a lot of stuff going, there's a lot of travel going on in the fall of 19 and up into the early spring of 20. And then it cut off. And in 2021, it's going to be the fall of 20 where there's no travel. In the spring of 21, where again, very low travel. There were a few virtual conferences offered then, and essentially we funded virtual conferences. Okay. Mm. Is that included in that seven number? Just curious. Are yeah. those like virtual? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. There were just a few, very uh -huh. few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the travel with a with a star. So I mean the seven with a star, so you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can I ask you a question related to this one? Sure. Um so I thought during um, your presentation, you mentioned this um, $250 and I was kind of unsure where it went. It sounded like there might've been, um, the students receive a thousand dollars and then they kind of pick faculty that supports that. And then the $250 is maybe allocated towards the faculty. Is there some sort of um, guideline on how the faculty spends that? Is that um, research guided? Is that like a take home $250 or what does that look like as far as where that $250 goes? Faculty will not get paid from that. They have to use this for research related. Often it's materials or supplies or maybe you know some software they have to, uh, 250 will not do by alone, would not make a big difference, yeah, no, it but <laughs> they might have other resources and $250 is more like a token to, to tell them that we recognize the time that you're spending with, with undergraduate students, but they, they cannot take that as a salary. So yeah, that, that goes like towards whatever research project they're yes, working on? Yes. Related to the undergrad that That's right. was awarded that? Yes. Okay. And we also keep the department head in the loop to make sure of this thing. Okay. And we check it. <laughs> I, I mean, I figured I just was a little. No, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's, a good question. It, it's not a not a free thing to the faculty member, but but it is guided also to help the students. Okay. 
this folder on this side. Uh, is yours on this yep. side too? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll just jump in. Um, for student travel, um, is that um, are 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 those totals that four hundred to eight hundred restricted specifically for like travel to those conferences? That that is like its sole um, entire purpose. And is that only for conferences, or does that include some type of professional development type of? Uh, oh, it's it's many things. Okay. It, it it could be you know for uh, science departments it will be a conference and conference we give for those things we give first priority to students who are presenting maybe a poster but uh, sometimes we also uh, send them to conferences even they are not presenting just to be there uh, just to go to a chemistry conference with 5000 chemists it it would make a big impact on 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 your on your understanding of the subject how how vast this whole thing is and you're part of that that enterprise. But we also use that for other performance. I mean, students go for, for music department, they, they go to, to uh, for their uh, uh, choral presentation, for their uh, playing some music somewhere, um, they, they can go part of a big tour and part of a big group. So we can sometimes we have supported what fifty students in one one shot. Yeah, yeah. So they went to a national. They were invited to a very prestigious national choral yeah. assembly, and so we so and support model UN and other yeah. sort of student activities like that. And I should mention in terms of the conferences too, we send people to dance and theater conferences as well as scientific conferences. So it's it's spread out very it's distributed very broadly amongst all the departments yeah. in terms of the students because and the students we have as many students doing research in theater as we do in chemistry so it's so we we you know, we determined that our scan activity right so there's the create there there's you know there's the research and there's a creative activity and discovery too that's all included in it. So sometimes we, we get a little lazy and just say research, but it's actually all this R mm -hmm. and all the creative activity that that we're doing in the college. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I guess follow up on that. Um, how does like funding like application wise go? Do do students submit like some type of application and then the department um, handles that, or is that more of like um, a dean level um, approving those those funding? So that's the money that kept in the college because of the dean's level approval. Okay. That's what I mean by kept in the college. It, it goes back to the students, but the application process comes to the to the dean's office. So we have. Uh, three times we ask for applications in fall, spring, and summer. And our summer number is large, as you can imagine why, because students will have more time to, to travel. Although sometimes our spring numbers, before they graduate, our spring numbers are also pretty large. Yeah. Fall numbers are a little lower. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd so say applications on the web page and it's updated with the deadlines and that for every uh, semester. So, and the students are generally informed in a variety of different ways. Yeah, speaking of that, yes, the application, I think for spring funding is a week from this Friday. So this is, yeah, all sorts of, this is super applicable to me. Uh, my question was kind of about what was the mechanism behind the decrease in the undergraduate research awards? Uh, because like research is still happening. Is that just a decrease in applications? Are there just less student projects going on? What was the, do you know like why yeah, the so decrease? I, the travel makes a lot more sense to me, like the decrease yeah. in the awards doesn't. So what happened last year, if you recall, there was a time that the, the labs were shut down mm -hmm. and then the labs came back kind of, from the hibernation mode, mm -hmm. right? The reawakening and all that. So because of that, uh, the participation of students in, in lab-based research was much less. And, and that uh, students are also taking mostly classes in via online that also created this, this effect. And I, I, I believe, we believe that this is just a one-year 
anomaly and, and it'll be it'll clear out. We're already seeing trains that it's clearing out. So you think that was mostly due to like the lack of the summer application funding? Because that was when the labs were like, oh, shit, everything. That makes sense. The summer is the big, big, big time for, for this. And, and during the reopening process, we prioritize graduate students to get in there so they can do their funded research and so that they can graduate in a timely manner. And so the undergraduates were only allowed in further on in that reawakening process. So it wasn't until you know, this fall that a lot of students are actually getting back into the labs. And we have, as Dr. and Dean Chakravarti said, have had a substantial increase in number of applications. Um, one quick question I had just out of general curiosity, um, that like student travel money um, existing in the college, do you know, is that like unique to arts and sciences throughout um, our university, whether it's funded by like a college specific fee or anything else, just having departments or a college level with funding available for that? Uh, it may not be. I mean, I know that graduate school provides some money. Um, other colleges, I'm not so sure. They may have a different mechanism, not not um, maybe through, through the research funding or their uh, foundation accounts. They might have other methods. I, I cannot imagine that a college would not find a way to send their undergraduates to conferences, you know? So I, I can say all, all of the colleges have some sort of student uh, uh, funding for student travel, but the amounts vary greatly yeah. how much they, they're able to invest in this very, very greatly by the colleges. Gotcha. They all have some opportunity yeah. to travel. Yeah. Can I ask kind of a follow-up to that? Um, is that why um, there are funds available like through the Graduate Student Council um, or the grad school, they can um, apply for funding and then also through um, SGA that they can apply with like student services fees allocations. Is that why there are kind of multiple avenues for applying for that? So um, I, I, I can start and then you, you, you can add on to it. Um, so the, there are fees in the, in, in the, 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 the student government gave a tiny bit and they, it's not always designed just for for no, travel. it's very small. It would not cover Yeah, very it's very, much. very <laughs> tiny amount. Like maybe a couple of meals. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that will not help. Actually, even $400 for travel out of state for a conference is really nothing. Mm -hmm. So they have to search for, for other supports. Oftentimes, if they're connected to a research grant, mm -hmm. then that gives them some money. If they are traveling to some uh, musical conference, there might be some donor money that's supporting them to some extent. So we put all these things together. Sometimes graduate school also gives a little bit of money. You know, there might be some money for our uh, underrepresented students from other sources. So it, it's multiple things that, that one puts in. This, this is a, this is a, Substantial amount, but it's not close to what they need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Provost Tema, do you have something? That's to perfect. Yeah. Chakravarti said exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to uh, kind of just on, I think it's on slide. Um, so, slide nine, um, you have a $400. Twenty thousand um, dollar. It's six slides up from yeah. now. Yeah. It'll be like so the budget. Yeah, under thing. under budget four hundred and twenty thousand dollars around there. Are you guys planning to uh, kind of fund those large uh, large equipment that you guys have been able to fund for the last few years? Um, not quite. Um, we have actually the, the fee. Even if we even if we spend all the money. Uh, we have a shortfall of, of just lab and supplies and just regular day-to-day -day business. Mm -hmm. We have a large shortfall because um, as I ex trying to explain that there's a fixed cost of GTS type and an advisor salary. So after that, as our um, student credit hour has gone down, we have very little money left for everything else. So this money, will help us this year to do everything. But, but actually we need a little bit more money for the fee to cover everything that you want to, want to cover. So we'll not do, we're not planning to do a large equipment um, distribution this year, 
but um, if we see, go to spring, not get enough, um, you know, demand from the department heads, which I doubt because they send us uh, the real need is over a million dollar, and we support a few hundred thousand. You know, so we this year we will be a little bit closer to that, but even then we'll have shortfall. So large equipment is not a not an option at this point. Chris, am I yeah, so generally in terms of the classroom supplies and materials, we get about a million dollars per year in requests from the departments. As you can see, we're only able to fund about half of that. And so this year, we're estimating that our fees will generate about $3.15 million. And so if you take a look at that, that means that I was only able to give about $350,000 to our classroom supplies and materials from this year's fee. So I'm using last year's fee um, overreach there or the, the surplus at 420 to, to support the classroom supplies and equipment up to about $700,000, which is still $300,000 short, but is helping some of those departments use um, you know, better support student learning in that sense. So, but that's going to be a one year yeah. thing. So, I estimate in FY23, we're only going to have about $250,000 made for classroom supplies and materials, which is $750,000 short. And I think that can really negatively affect student learning in the labs. So, and in, in the classrooms in general, because again, we, have to pay for annual software sub subscription licenses and we need to have a regular way of updating computers in like jmc and communications and in art and two hundred fifty thousand dollars just in allowing us to do that right now a couple questions kind of along those lines for those <clears throat> lab supplies first one's not uh, too complex. I'm assuming like those big chromatography systems and the x-ray apparatus, are those purely in teaching labs? Yeah. Cool. Those are, those are for teaching labs. Yeah. The yeah. specification is that they're only to be used and yeah. that's right. where you buy them. Right. And, and just so you know, I had a someone from uh, one of the EPA big research labs um, come here with his son for a visit. And this was five or six years ago before the fee was in. And he, you know, he asked me directly, you know, are you using the latest equipment in, in your mm -hmm. labs? And I, I couldn't tell him, yes. I mean, we had a 1980s GC with this equipment, uh, with this, with the equipment grants, we were able to get mm -hmm. a new thermal Fisher GC, the same type that you would use in a lab in the real world. And that's been very helpful for our students, right? So they can get you know, practice on an instrument that they would actually use. And I will tell you this for graduate students in many of the science areas, having um, experience in chromatography really helps you get a job, especially if you're using instrumentation and software that they're going to be using in industry. So. Did that student end up coming to K-State or? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The story could have had a better ending. <laughs> 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 it would please us to think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we actually, I, I think it, it is actually a better ending because he'll come back and say we need more money. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. yeah, and kind of the second part to that is on the other side is buying those software licenses in bulk. I know that can be a large part of those fixed costs. Is there what does that process look like? Are you able to buy those licenses in bulk and strike kind of deals with that? Is that kind of more of a patchwork deal? What does that process look like? We deal with that a lot on the student services fee side. Too. Because I need to help here. So. Yeah, so right now, I mean, most departments deal with their own software mm -hmm. licenses. I mean, if we had a better way of doing this at the university level, it'd be nice, you know, like for the Adobe Suites, mm -hmm. SPSS type softwares. Um, stuff like that, but some of the software is more specialized that only a single department might use, like some of the graphic design uh, suites and some of the JMC stuff. But there are other software packages that I think that if we could get a university site license, it would be much more economical. Mm -hmm. I'll just throw in there for everybody to know, we're, we're establishing a, a new committee for academic um, information technology 
this would be a commission mm -hmm. partnership with the yeah. faculty senate and this committee is going to try to do exactly what chris was just talking about and Actually, yeah. find opportunities for efficiencies in software that's used for teaching purposes mm -hmm. across the Thanks. That reminds me a lot about mobile credentials. So I almost wonder if that <laughs> should be moved into that conversation too. So we can talk about yeah, that. Talk about that. <laughs> um, any oh one question um, that I that I had on the GTA salary supplements. Um, that one's uh, really interesting to me. What does that look like on the GTA side? Um, so like how how much does that look like as far as increase to their salaries, if that's something that... Yeah, so it varies because you need, every department has its own 2016 median that we targeted. And that varies from English to, to biochemistry. Biochemistry is one of the largest, actually. Uh, biochemistry GTA, uh, to, to attract anyone really good, you are probably going to pay between 25 and 30,000 a year as, for 12 months um and and some and that in that is there's a large number for uh, if you look at for a gta stipend but that's the reality there and that's that's the average in in the big 12 or with our peers if you go to english department um they will be very happy to get their stipend but uh this is not what we are targeting so it creates a kind of a uh, different distribution and different stipend for for different departments, which has its you know which has its, it creates a different problem that when the students meet with each other and get to know that uh, uh, it, it creates some tension. But that's the best we can do at this point. Even then, we are behind. We are at the twenty sixteen level. Um, we have faculty salary also different over the university. I mean, if you go to, to business school versus uh, college versus our college, engineering, we have different salaries for, for different uh, faculty in different departments. So it's not unusual, but, um, but that's, what, that's what happens with the, at the graduate student stipend level also. Can I ask so, a follow-up about that? Yeah. Have you, so you said that, um, to be competitive, then it seems like they might have changed in the last few years. Um, some might have increased. Have you noticed that there are more grad applicants, or are you? How are you measuring that you are um, uh, marketing to and recruiting a higher caliber or like better grad student? Okay, so um, several markers we we use for that as as a number of applicants is one marker but also number of, of PhDs. Many of these graduate students are, are doing their PhDs. The number of PhDs that, that the college is, is approving every year, we're looking at that number. That number has gone up for us as well, pre-pandemic. It, it went down a little bit. So we had our highest number right before pandemic was uh, 70 PhDs, PhD graduates in, in one year, which is a pretty decent number for our That's college. The whole college. For the whole college, yeah. Yeah. So our GTA numbers is about five times that, so 350 or so. So, you know, 70 PhDs uh, a year is a pretty decent number compared to other our peers. Did you, sorry, did you say it was 70 graduating each year, yeah. PhD? Yeah. Oh. Um, can I ask kind of a related question? Sure. Um, in one of the slides, it said that the graduate retention rate, um, and it looked like it's a six-year um, time period for graduate students. That's not graduate students. That, that's the undergraduate number that we have. We um, don't have any graduate number there for retention. So it's almost at the very end. Um, Let me go there. This is a six-year grad rate. Oh, oh, oh I think that's my general graduation. graduation. It's a six-year undergraduate graduation rate. So you're counting the undergraduate. Only the undergraduate. Okay, I was like, yeah. why are grad students <laughs> taking six years? Can we address this? Oh, that, that, that will not be And good. why are we funding them this long? <laughs> okay, that's great. That's great. Yeah, so it's undergraduate uh, graduation rate. So there's some sort of incentive, it seems like, then, for an undergrad to apply for grad school here, so... 
you're doing a great job in retaining them. <laughs> we can do much better with that. That one aspect that you're not doing as well, uh, we are looking into creating more four plus one type programs. We have, a, we have some opportunities here. Um, some of the opportunities we also have, I'm sidetracking, but because this is so important and so fresh in my mind, we're having a lot of discussion on that. Um, because of the pandemic, we have seen that many of our uh, teaching classes can be moved to online. So it, it gives us an opportunity to create this four plus one type, um, type graduate programs in, in, in many, many places. So might attract our own undergraduates and also students will pay tuition to take those classes. So we are working on that. This is a this is something that we haven't done in the past as much and bringing in all the departments to align in that it will take some time, but we'll get there. Um, Dean Chakravarty, <clears throat> so I know you mentioned earlier that um, you have like a fee proposal and I don't want to get too much into that since that isn't what this- Yeah, because about. You, you want me to be back one more time, right? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so in- in the event that that fee um, like is not approved for next year, um, for those like large classroom equipment um, type of expenses, as those get older, do you see this specific uh, current like distribution of fees changing at all? Uh, like, would you use that fee money to maybe address some of those concerns or um, some different areas? If that makes sense. It, made, it makes perfect sense. But uh, as we have looked at the numbers, after you pay for the fixed costs, right, for the advisor salaries, and, and that's going up also. Mm -hmm. um, we are hiring some advisors now. I'm, I'm comparing to my 2016 numbers. We cannot hire anyone with that salary. So the prices are going up, salaries are going up, and GTS stipend is going up if you want to attract um, better students. So there's a fixed part is a big part of the total money after our reduction in student credit hour. So there'll be very little money left just for day-to-day -day, um, lab and, and instructional uh, you know, expenses. And it, every, everywhere, every, every department. So I don't think we are going to look into large equipment. You just cannot. But you made a good point that these are bought in 2016 and many of them may be not functioning to, to the level that, that we had before. But right now, we cannot focus on that. We, we need to have the day-to-day the -day labs and, and instruction continue, and then work um, around that. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. There's also sort of dangerous, right? So the supplement just, so, so the graduate students get a certain base amount from the college budget and this supplements that but that supplement is needed for like in areas like math because right now the regular gta stipend in math would not be sufficient for a student to get a visa to come here and study because they wouldn't be making enough money so the supplement puts them above that minimum earning level so they could come here so it's a bad hobson's choice to have to make so yeah, gotcha. Because we can lose 100 GTAs or lose the advisors or not do the equipment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's tough. Yeah, thank you. I think we have, a, <clears throat> we have a good plan and we have just submitted that today to, to Provost Neighbor, a, a, a slight fee increase. And I, I believe that if, if it's approved, but you know, I, I understand it needs to go through multiple level, but I hope that that it would it will be approved. We will come here and, and make a uh, a strong case for it. At, at any level needed, we can make a strong case. How it affects student success, uh, we can make a very very strong case. After that, it's not in our hand; it's in your hand and beyond to, to the board of regents and all. So and, and we are willing to. To present at every level if there are questions to clarify something so that you can make your decision correctly gotcha. thank, you. thank you any other questions from from the group do you know just a rough breakdown uh, between the departments of 
how that, is it roughly equal to like the percentage of enrollment or how does that the distribution in each department break down between all of them? It roughly scales with, with their um, student grade hour because you can see that mm -hmm. it's not just their majors, right. but also they're teaching these large classes to students. So the student credit hour, it scales with, that's how the fee comes in. So it scales somewhere like that. And the majors, it scales to the advisors because advisors only advise uh, majors in our college, but the student credit hour uh, connects to students outside of the college also quite a bit. And so that's where the, the supplies money becomes more important, right? The, the GTA uh, varies from different departments to the department. It also somewhat connected to the student credit hour because first year, these GTAs participate in teaching, right? So that's also scales with student credit hour. Um, advisors scale with number of majors and lab supplies or instructional supplies also scale with student credit hour. So different scaling that, that they get. Mm -hmm. But some, some amount, some, some sort of scaling we look at very carefully so that we want to make sure that um, every department benefits from this. There can be some year-to-year -year variation. So for example, if JMC needs to upgrade a computer lab in one year, they're gonna get more than their fair share in political science will need and history might need it the next year to do their lab. So it's a look at long-term averages. Yeah. Yeah, my final question is uh, a lot of this is tied to enrollment. And so can you tell us just a little bit about arts and sciences role in recruitment. And you talked a little bit about retention of students, but what kind of recruitment efforts are going on at arts and sciences to help try and turn this trend around as our large, largest okay. college? This is my, my favorite topic this day, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you, you asked me this. So we are looking at this in, on, from multiple angles. Um, as you know, the, the trains, in-state trains of students graduating from high school and then coming to higher education, both numbers are working against us. So to do that, uh, we need to do really creative thinking in this college. You're not a professional college, so we have to have creative thinking. So what, what we are doing is that um, we are producing all our um, college materials that we send to students in both English and Spanish. This is something that we have just started. I think this will be a um, very important aspect of our student recruitment. So that's the new thing. The second thing we are doing is that we are writing, inviting all our alumni teachers. So the teachers who graduated from our college and teaching in, in Kansas high schools, we have written to every single one of them and invited them to bring their class to visit k State, and we'll pay for their travel, we'll buy some pizza to them, you know, students love that. <laughs> and what we love is that if a student comes to visit Kansas State, you know, they will see firsthand what we have to offer and what kind of people we are. And so uh, we are tracking some numbers and if they come to visit, our success rate varies from 85 to 95%, you know because that, that's a big number. So we need to, and that's why our enrollment got a big hit because of the pandemic, we, we couldn't bring them to campus. So that's one thing we're doing. We are also doing uh, some social media blasts. <laughs> this, is, this is stuff that I don't understand very well, but I'm, I'm working with folks who, who do it. It's, it. it's a bit scary. This is your world actually. <laughs> it's a bit scary that if we have this machine in some, some geo area, then um, this blast will, will put an ad to, to you. But you can also do geo plus, so they will send you a pixel, a cookie, if you eat that cookie, it's poisonous cookie. Anywhere you go now, you will see that ad, right? So, so, so we are spending um, resources now on that, which we haven't done before. And then last but not least, uh, we are revamping all our web pages in the in the departments and the college we have done. So we are connecting to that, and um, 
and also um, the general um, the general connections of faculty to to the students, high school students, we're trying to build that, rebuild that. So several ways we are doing that. Um, we are using the, the Oleta campus as for uh, a connection to the uh, our largest county students, you know, in Johnson County. So our faculty member can go and then connect to that. We're, we're building that process. We are also planning to have a summer camp next summer for uh, students in that area. Again, with Oleta as a hub, we are teaming up with College of Engineering to do so. Uh, the students will uh, go through some sort of presentations, uh, hands-on activities in the morning, and then they will visit various institutes in the Kansas City area. So this is one of our, our proposals. That we're working on. So multiple ways that, that we are trying to address these, these questions. Some advertisements, some very creative way, but also oftentimes trying to connect to the student. And when there is a student group, you know, wildcat preview days or something, I, if I'm in town, I love to visit with the families myself and, and talk about various things on their, on their mind. Awesome. Love that you asked that question, Max, and I loved hearing about um, all those things. That's yeah. really remarkable and, and makes me feel really good about it. It will take some time. This is not a yeah. six months kind of result, but, but uh -huh. it, will, it will get there. I may I also add that so we've started creating some new degree programs and environmental science is one of those. And I was advising a new student in that, and that student told me that they would have left K-State had it not been for us now offering this. And so this, this one you get. Yeah. This <laughs> but this um, degree program has been very, very popular in terms of the students applying now. I mean it's more popular than half the other sort of degree programs in the college in terms of the number of applicants coming. So, so we're really excited about that. We have an integrated computer science program and integrated health studies program. And I think all of those can be really popular. And two of those are multi-college. So we're collaborating amongst colleges in order to make these successful. Yeah. Next year, a couple more coming up too. So. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, to give you a, a that, uh, how remarkable these things are is that the college has not offered a new degree program in the last 10 years. It's like an oil tanker, right? <laughs> to, to steer it, it, it takes some time. It, it, it has a lot of inertia. But now we are, um, we are offering um, various new uh, majors that the students want to be part of. We are, we are working on a, a digital media uh, offerings that I, I think are going to be very, very successful. The, the modern day of journalism and, and all that, a sports media that we are coming up, a criminology program that's coming up. We are really steering the, the college in ways that are forward looking and there's a lot of student interest. It's really, really good to hear. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. <clears throat> Any other, what other questions do we have as a group? I want to give the good awkward pause a try or anything else. Um, and if there are any questions, um, please, uh, everyone here, feel free to email them to myself, um, endowed at ksu or endowed three at ksu.edu. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and collect those. And then any questions that we have between now and next week, um, I'll send them uh, your way, uh, Dean Charles Perry and Chris. Um, and yeah, we'll most likely, um, considering that we covered a lot of ground um, today with presentation and questions, um, I have a pretty pretty strong hunch that uh, next week we'll probably do questions for a little bit in the beginning, um, kind of air out those last ones. Um, so that shouldn't uh, take up too much time, and then I will probably move into a decision um, afterwards on that. Um, so love to, to have you both back just for a brief bit of time, um, not to take too much of your evening next week. Um, but thank you again for a uh, very well done presentation. Uh, I think on behalf of all of us, we're um, really, really pleased at how this came out. So um, thanks for working with us. I want to thank everyone. This is a very important process. You know, this is shared governance at its best, that, that when we connect to multiple levels from student to the provost, 
part of the decision process. Uh, this is an important thing and not many universities do this. So we feel, we feel really fortunate to be part of this. And to me, the process is very, very important. Of course, I would like to have a decision in our favor, but the fact that I could come here and present to you is an important part of being at case state. We, we value that. So thank you. I thought I said that better myself. I think we are adjourned. Thank you all. all right. <laughs>